as most of you know, I am a teacher, so I talk for a living. Give me a thousand kids under the age of 11, and I'm not nervous at all. Standing in front of you all makes me really nervous. Um, so for now, you all are the age of 11 and younger, uh, just for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so I apologize in advance for any nervous tics or anything that occur during this message. Um, not a professional preacher, but I will try. So I'm going to have you do something that I have my students do a lot when I want them to kind of focus and um, envision what's going on. So if you would, close your eyes for a second. And I want you to picture in your head something you have said never to. Picture what that would look like if you actually did it. Picture what that would look like if you didn't do it and you continued to say never. And then you can open your eyes. Actually, I should have you all keep them closed. It makes me less nervous. <laughs> so, so never say never. How many times do we use the word never? I tried to Google that. Google didn't have an answer, so it must be a lot, because Google knows everything. If, you, if you're anything like me, you've said it a lot. Many times, we use this word without even thinking. Here are just a few examples from when I have used the word never. I said I would never marry a banker. For those of you who don't know, most of my family is in banking, and even though Kevin went to school for urban planning, he is also now a banker. I said I would never teach in a city school. I was born and raised in Winchester, Indiana. God put me in a school on the south side of Muncie for three years at the beginning of my career. I said I would never teach higher than third grade. I currently teach fourth grade. I said I would never have a good enough testimony to share. Yet here I stand in front of all of you. In all of these instances, God has proven me wrong. He reminds me over and over again that even though I plan every second of my life in my planner, he ultimately has the final say. Three and a half years ago, I sat in the pews and again made a never statement. Becky Melton shared that she would be donating a kidney to her professor. I remember sitting in amazement at her bravery and courage. I remember thinking how amazing it would be to hear God's voice so clearly about such an important decision. I have a very prominent fear of needles. I won't even get a flu shot because the sight of a needle makes me cringe and break out into a cold sweat and pass out. When Becky shared about donating her kidney, I immediately said I could never do something like that. In the past year, my Sunday school class has done study after study about stepping out of your comfort zone. One study spoke about the story of Peter walking on water, and that's the first scripture I want to share with you today. I'm going to read Matthew 14, 25 through 33. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when the, he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. <clears throat> Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter listened to Jesus' voice and made the decision to step out of the boat. Peter, trusting in God, stepped out of his comfort zone. This message that I just read to you has seemed to jump out at me over and over and over and over again in the past year. Even though most of you see me as an outgoing, bubbly person, I'm not a person that enjoys stepping out of my comfort zone. I like being in my box. I don't like taking chances. I like being safe. Again, it's something 
I've said I could never do. We have also spoken in Sunday school at great length about listening for God's voice and what that sounds like. So I would like to read um, 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel, Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. I have always thought I knew what God's voice sounded like to me, but I've recently figured out for sure what it means for me to hear the voice of God. He doesn't yell audibly at me. I think a lot of us would say, that'd be a lot easier. He'd just, you know, tap us on the shoulder and yell in our ear. Be a lot easier. When I hear God, my heart starts to race. And something I have been thinking about begins to pop into my head at different times in different situations. This past August, I heard, God, I heard God's voice very, very clearly. I was perusing Facebook. I do that a lot. When I found a post about someone I graduated high school with. Josh Giese needed a kidney transplant, and they were looking for a living donor. As I usually do in those situations, especially when I know needles are involved, I let the family know I'll be praying for them, and I also shared the information on Facebook. As I began praying for the Giese family, I started to not be able to shake the strange feeling that I was supposed to do something more than just pray. Outreach hosted Church Has Left the Building on the Sunday, shortly following this post. This is where we meet um, at the four-way in Lynn. I mentioned to Mom and Nikki how I was feeling and asked them to pray that I would know exactly what to do. When prayer requests were taken, Brad Fisher, thanks Brad, stood and asked the church to be praying for a fellow police officer who needed a kidney. You guessed it. Brad said it was Josh. I almost fell out of my chair. My heart started racing, and the same thought started circulating in my head again. What if I was supposed to do something about this? God wasn't letting me get away with just sharing a Facebook post. He had a much bigger plan. So that Monday, I decided to call the number that was posted on Facebook and at least do the medical interview over the phone. I didn't know if it was too late. The information had been out there for a few days. Um, but I decided that I felt God was calling me to do this. I prayed before I made the call that if this was truly what I was supposed to do, that all the doors and windows would fly open. But if this was not what God was calling to me, me to do, I wanted him to slam all the windows and doors shut tightly, lock the doors, and throw away the keys. When I called the number... I had to leave a message. I thought, okay, God, it's in your hands. I honestly didn't even expect a phone call in return. Lo and behold, the next day I received a phone call. This turned into a medical interview over the phone. After a half an hour conversation, it was decided that I sounded like a good potential donor and that the advocate would be sending me paperwork and blood work orders to see if my blood type matched Josh. Needles immediately popped into my head. But instead of instantly feeling fear that usually happens every single time, I felt peace. That was strange. I had never felt that or way before about anything medical. Just ask that row of people over there. <laughs> that is when I knew that God had completely taken over the situation and was in full control. For the first time in my life, I didn't have fear thinking about doctors, needles, and all things medical. I asked my dear friend Nikki to go with me to Muncie to have my blood drawn. Just in case I passed out, she'd have to drive me home. She agreed and went with me. My prayer was that God would use this experience for his will. I prayed that I would be able to share why I was doing what I was doing, and that I would honor God in every step that I took. The time for the blood draw came, and you can ask Nikki, I almost passed out. But I never once felt afraid. I continued to pray that God's will would be done in this situation. I had told the few people that knew I was having my blood tested that, if nothing else, I'd finally know my blood type. Always looking at the positive. A few days of waiting occurred. Through this entire
entire time, I simply prayed that God's hand would be present and that his will would be done. A few days later, I received a phone call letting me know that I had the blood type of O. And not only did I now know my blood type, I knew I was a match for Josh. I also found out that there were two other people who also matched Josh. So there were three of us at this point that were potential donors for him. I also found out, um, I was asked to go for a second round of testing, which would begin to determine whether or not I would be Josh's donor. At this point, God really started to open every door and window. It's funny what happens when you pray for that. I had originally thought I wouldn't have enough paid days to take off work. But it turned out I have enough paid days to take five weeks if necessary. My principal completely supported me and told me to do what I felt God was leading me to do. I had a student teacher cancel her placement only for another student teacher to be placed in my room for the second semester this year. All of these things happened within the span of two weeks. I also reached out to Becky Melton and asked her about her experience. Not only did I have the support from those who knew I was going through this process, I had someone who lived the process to talk to. The second round of tests included a massive blood draw, 17 vials of blood, an EKG, and a chest x-ray. I went to these appointments by myself, and I felt oddly calm. Again, this is not normal for me, someone who's white, who has white coat syndrome. I knew very clearly that God was walking with me. When he calls us to do something and we step out of that boat in faith, God is not going to let us walk alone. 17 vials of blood, by the way, didn't pass out this time. An EKG and chest x-ray later, I was heading home to wait and pray again. I received a phone call telling me my potassium levels were low and that my EKG had come back abnormal. I agreed to redo the two tests and started to think that maybe this was God starting to close a door. <coughs> I knew there was a purpose to all of this, either way it went, but I had no idea what that would be. My potassium levels came back normal. I even ate a banana. I hate bananas, the things that I have done. Um, that's totally God. I didn't uh, get sick on the way to the hospital eating my banana. Um, but my second each EKG came back abnormal again. At this point, they asked me to do an echocardiogram. I had no idea what that was. I went in for the echo, which is really cool to see, actually. It's an ultrasound on your heart, if you don't know. Um, and it's black and white, so there was no blood or anything, so I was okay. <laughs> and um, I was like the three-year-old that asks question after question. My son does this to me currently. The, they had turned this screen so I could see it. And um, I asked the ultrasound tech like 35 million questions. Um, she looked at me and she said, you must be a teacher. <laughs> How'd you know? Um, so I went in and um, they did the echo and went back home to wait. I was convinced that I would get a call saying something was wrong and that I could not continue in the process. Um, so there was a lot of praying going on, and I think a lot of you saw that on Facebook that I posted of having the echo, and I couldn't tell anyone why. Um, so a lot of you were actually praying for me during that time. I did receive a call, but it wasn't what I expected. The echo was completely normal, and the EKG results were deemed faulty. Yet another showing of God's power. I was also asked to go in for a third and final round of testing. I also found out that there was now only one other person besides me still in the testing process. Kevin took me to Indy for the third round of testing. I had to meet with different people. I had to talk to a psychologist, who, by the way, said I'm completely normal. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I had to have a CAT scan to trace my kidney function. It was a long day of testing. Yes, more needles involved. But throughout the day, I had a complete sense of calm. I continually prayed that God's will would be done and that I would have the chance to share with the medical team God's calling. I had the chance to talk to different nurses and medical staff about following God's will. It was humbling and exciting to know that God was walking right beside me. I surprisingly, again, wasn't afraid. After this round of testing, I knew that there was still one other person besides me. And 
I knew that more waiting for news was ahead of me. For those of you who know me, I'm not good at waiting. A few days later, I received a call that I needed to do one last test. I was told that the CAT scan showed that my kidneys might not be functioning equally and that this could potentially end my journey. I had to go in for a renal exam to test exactly what percentage each kidney was functioning at. Again, my prayer was that God would simply have his hand in this test and that his will would be done. Now, during a renal exam, they um, inject radioactive material into your arm and they light your kidneys up like Christmas trees. It's really cool, actually. And you lay on a table and there's a camera under you um, that scans your kidney. I had to lay there staring up at a screen showing my kidneys for half an hour. If you know me, I don't stop for longer than five minutes. So I just laid there watching the screen of my kidneys all lit up, and I had no idea what I was looking at for half an hour. So I started to pray and pep talk my kidneys, which is strange. Um, I prayed that at that moment, what was showing on the screen is what God intended. I also told my kidneys to get it together and do what they needed to do. I know I'm weird, but there was nothing else to do for half an hour. I knew this moment, this one last test, could make or break this opportunity. I still didn't know God's plan, but I knew he had one. <coughs> Five days later, I received a phone call. I recognized the phone number, and my heart immediately jumped in my throat. This was the call that would determine the purpose for all of this. The phone call revealed that I was the match for Josh. The other person that had been in the running had a scheduling conflict. It all came down to that. A scheduling conflict, which is ironic because I am a scheduled person. I was told that my name had been, been submitted to the team of surgeons, that they were reviewing all of my tests and would make the final determination. I hung up the phone and immediately felt God just completely wash over me. His power had been shown over and over, and I simply was the vessel he chose. It was such an awesome mix of emotions, excitement, anxiousness, and awe of God's mighty power. Two days later, a confirming phone call told me that I was the no, no longer the owner of two kidneys, but that I was simply the owner of one and kidney sitting the other. An eviction notice had been served to my left kidney for January 13th, 2016. After four months of tests, waiting, and praying, God's plan was revealed. This entire time, he had chosen me. What a humbling moment. God could have chosen anyone, but he chose me. I have been asked many questions since following God's leading into the journey of donating my kidney. I have been asked if I am scared. My answer is always no. I'm not scared. A little anxious, maybe. I'm sure I'll be nervous the hours before, but I'm not scared. God's got this. He brought me this far and won't leave me now. I have also been asked if I'm sure I want to do this. My answer is yes, I am certain. I know that God has put me on this path for a reason, and I will do what he asks me to do. I've even be asked if I've been asked if I've gone crazy. Well, that is debatable. However, if following God is crazy, then crazy I certainly am. I often wonder, what would have happened had I chosen to ignore God's voice? I wonder what would have happened had I not stepped out of the boat? What would have happened if I had continued to say, never? I'm not perfect, and there are many other things that I say never to. And I have this theory that God sits in heaven and looks at me and points and laughs daily because I tell him all these things and he has other plans for me. After this experience, I sit and wonder what other nevers God intends to change. This hasn't been easy. There have been scary moments, moments of doubting if I actually heard God's voice and moments of fear. But in the end, listening and following God has been totally worth it. It always is. Here is my challenge to you. What is God asking you to do? What have you said, I could never do that to? You're right. We can never do anything on our own, that is. We can only do everything we do with God's help and leading. Has he asked you to 
step out of your boat? Has he spoken to you in a way that only you understand? Maybe he is calling you to talk to the new guy at work. Maybe he is calling you to reach out to an old friend. He might even be calling you to donate a kidney. When God asks you to step out of the boat, to trust him, to listen to him, do it. Don't hesitate. He will be glad you did. And who knows, he may lead you to do other things you said you would never do, like speaking in front of your church. Never say 